Good morning, church, and welcome to another online service here at Spanish Fort. We hope and pray that everything's going well with you. Uh, we also want to remind you that if you have a need or if we can help you in any way, please reach out to us here and we'll be more than happy to help you with that. We hope that these services are encouraging and uplifting. A number of you have posted things on Facebook, and we hope you'll continue to do that. We just want to be able to bless you in any way that we possibly can while we're in this situation where we can't come together and we can't worship together in this place. Let's begin today with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you and we praise you for all that you are and all that you do. Father, we thank you for your blessings and your protection that you've given us. I pray for the church, Lord. I pray that you'll be with us all. You'll continue to watch over us. You'll continue to encourage us. Father, may we look to you for our hope and our guidance. May we trust in you in all things. Father, we know that you are greater than anything, that you're greater than any virus or anything that could ever happen. And so we put our faith in the sovereignty that you manifest and we see it each and every day in our lives. Father, bless us today as we praise you. Bless us today as we worship. Thank you for being our God. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. And all the church said, amen. Let's get ready to worship. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. We need to be in your 
been baking a lot of bread lately at home. Um, I guess it's just a side effect of being isolated and stuck in my house. 
And you, like me, may be stuck in your home and not, not having ready access to unleavened bread and maybe asking yourself, what is this theme of leaven that's going throughout the Bible? Why is this so important? If you go back to Exodus, you'll find out. So Passover has occurred, right? All the firstborn sons of Egypt have been killed, and the Israelites are freed from bondage, and they have to get out of there, right? And God tells his people, go, and go so quickly that you're not even to let your bread rise, Now, if you've baked bread before at home, you may be saying to yourself, oh, well, that's not very much time. It only takes bread a few hours to rise. And a few hours isn't a lot of time for anybody to uproot their life and get going. Well, as a point of fact, and a fact that has been known since the earliest bread making, that any simple dough that you make, you combine flour and water. After about 18 minutes, the yeast from the air itself will inoculate this bread and it will slowly become a sourdough, itself a leavening agent. 18 minutes. So I say this just to say, they left very quickly. So they leave, and then God tells them, you're to celebrate that I freed you from bondage by every year having 24 hours of Passover, and then seven days of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Now during this time, during this feast, they're to only eat unleavened bread. For seven days, and they're supposed to also remove all leaven from their households. Now, if anybody is found with leaven in their household, or if anybody eats leavened bread, they're to be cast out of the community, no longer a part of God's people, which feels pretty harsh and very uh, critical Old Testament. But the Bible makes this very clear throughout the entirety of it, where leaven is more often than not used as a negative metaphor for sin. You see, a little bit of leaven can be placed in any amount of dough, and it will infiltrate the entirety of that dough. And a little bit of sin came into this world, infiltrated all of the world. Christ himself says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, beware the leaven of Herod. So basically, what the Lord is telling them to do is, For these seven days, you're going to eat unleavened bread to remind yourself that I delivered you from bondage, that you are my people, and that you're to be different. You're to be set apart. So this tradition goes on for centuries. They have this festival every year. And they develop this method for making sure that their bread has absolutely zero leaven in it whatsoever. What they do is they make the dough very fast, because remember, they only have 18 minutes They roll it out very thin, and then they poke a bunch of holes in it and bake it. And the holes are so that air itself won't even make the bread rise. And it was with this bread and during this festival that Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room to have the Last Supper. Christ took this bread that for centuries has represented the Hebrews' deliverance from bondage, this bread that has no leaven, this bread that has been pierced. And he breaks it, and he hands it to his disciples, and he says, take this bread, this is my body given to you. Shortly thereafter, that same man, without sin, is pierced and dies to free us from the bondage of sin. Christ does make one positive mention of leaven. In Matthew chapter 13, in a parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a little bit of leaven placed into a jar of flour until it infiltrates the whole jar. You see, a little bit of sin can take over this whole world, but a little bit of the kingdom can do the exact same thing. Christ died to free us from the leaven of sin so that we could be the leaven of the kingdom. Let's pray for the bread. Father, as we partake of this unleavened bread, I pray that we can be thoughtful of our deliverance from sin by your perfect Son, who is without sin. Father, I also pray that our lives, this church, and this world be changed by the leaven of your Spirit. 
Father, bless this time. Help us to take this bread in a manner that is worthy of you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, continue by giving thanks for the fruit of the vine. God, as we are trapped in our homes right now, I pray that we can remember when your people were trapped in their homes during Passover and saved by the blood of the Lamb. God, we are so thankful that we are saved by the blood of your Son, the perfect Lamb. God, I pray that as we... uh, partake of this fruit of the vine this morning, that we will remember his sacrifice, that we will remember how it covers our sins, and that we would take in a manner that is worthy of you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. In just a moment, you'll uh, see on your screen all of the many ways that you can give to this church during this time so that this church can continue its good work in this community. Um, I know that, uh, that it is a very stressful time for not just our community, but the whole world economically right now. And a lot of people are, are very concerned financially. And I just hope that even during this time as Christians, that we could still be cheerful givers, and generous people. And not just with our our tithing to this church, but with our interactions with the whole world. I think during a time like this, it is especially important that we continue to cheerfully give and that we continue to be generous people. And I think that's just one small way that we could be the leaven of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your good work that goes on through this church. God, we are so thankful that we have been blessed so richly. Lord, there is a a lot of hardship occurring in the world right now, and we just, we pray for, for this whole world. God, I pray that right now that we would give as we have intended to give to the church, but I also pray that we would set our intentions to be givers to our community. Father, thank you so much for this example that you set for us and for your son who died for us. It's in his name we pray, amen.
all things are for the glory of God. This was the heartbeat of Jesus while he was here on earth. It was his highest goal, his loftiest aim while here on earth. That is evidenced most by Jesus' instruction in talking about prayer. To this end, all petitions that go up to God begin and end with a resounding praise for God. The alpha, the omega of our prayers should center themselves around glory for God. When he was once asked by his disciples to offer some instruction on prayer, Jesus said, here's how you begin. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And here's how you end. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The key thought of prayer is that they should be obsessed with God. But unfortunately, too many times our prayers have become self-absorbed. And they're fueled by our self-indulgences. The prosperity gospel has diminished prayer into nothing more than a name and claim it shopping list. I'm reminded of two salesmen that showed up at church uh, to meet with a church committee about purchasing something. And after they'd given their sales pitch, the chairman of the committee went over to the corner and knelt down. And after praying for a few moments, he came back and said, well, the Lord says he thinks we should wait. And one of the salesmen got up and went over to that same corner, and he knelt down, and he too prayed for a little while and came back and said, he wants to talk to you again. Now, I'm not sure that either one of those men actually were praying. But it is interesting to note that they both saw prayer as a way to get what they wanted. Prayer can become like that. We, we pour out our woes. It does become self-absorbed. And unfortunately, we become discontent or less interested in developing a dialogue where we listen to what it is that God actually wants to say to us. But as Jesus taught his disciples, the primary focus in prayer should move off of ourselves and move toward the supreme glory of God. When we pray, and when we begin to recognize who God is and what God is, inevitably what happens is this, we gain an even greater desire about who God is and what God is. Uh, This morning, we want to go back to Matthew 6. We want to examine that prayer that Jesus used to give instruction to his disciples when they ask him about it. And in doing so, what I hope that we're able to do is we're able to develop some understanding of what God-centered prayers should be about. God-centered prayers pray for the unfolding of his reign. Some of you perhaps are fans of the old Star Trek series. And if you are, then you remember that almost in every single episode, either Captain Kirk or Spock would say, Beam me up, Scotty. That's what happens sometimes with our prayers. God, get me out of here. God, get me out of this mess. God, get me out of this situation. Yet, Jesus taught the idea of a God-centered prayer actually inviting God to join us in our life here on earth. God, if you're not going to get me out of here, then join me. God, if somehow you're not going to end this mess, then go through it with me. If, God, you're not going to get rid of the situation, then hold my hand as I experience it. And too many of our prayers end up being centered around our kingdoms. God, I want you to come and fix my little kingdom. And the idea of asking God to rule and reign while here on earth as we exist And to display his power and his glory is too often omitted from our petitions to God. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is a part of the model prayer that maybe we have set aside. In Matthew chapter 6, part of that prayer, Jesus said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And since we understand and know that the kingdom has come in the form of the church, Maybe we have set apart this side of the prayer and dismissed it, having no application really for our life, but yet maybe the application is this. 
How often are we so busy asking God about our kingdoms that we fail to ask God to bless his kingdom? If his kingdom has come and is existing and belongs to God, then there, is there anything outside of his boundaries? Kingdom prayers are not small prayers. You remember in Acts chapter 4 that Peter and John had been instructed by the council to stop preaching about the kingdom. And they go back and in verse 31 it tells us, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are about to be sent out by the church at Antioch on a mission trip. The Bible says they fasted and they prayed and they sent them out. And in verse 49, it says, And the word of the Lord was spread throughout the whole region. You see, I'm afraid sometimes there's an tension in the lives of a lot of Christians. And here it is. That we believe that God was active in the past. And we certainly hope and trust that God will be active in the future. But sometimes we struggle not being sure whether or not God is still active in the presence. And so we come together and we hear all these amazing stories about God and what God did. How that he walked on water. He, he brought fire from heaven. Caused a virgin to give birth to his son. Dead men coming from the tomb. And we've got to remember that these tremendous testimonies from God's Word are not there to teach the church of what God could do, but rather they're there to show the church what God can do. Kingdom prayers is asking God to have reign in the hearts of men and that the kingdom might expand here on earth, making His kingdom the primary concern of our hearts results in prayers where the primary focus becomes God-centered. God-centered prayers pray for not only the unfolding of his reign, but the unleashing of his power. You see, we need to start acknowledging God's ability to answer prayer. Now, I know that we all believe that, but we need to really grab hold of that and the fact that he can accomplish his purpose. God does not have to have a thousand tests to figure out what's going to work. God doesn't have to have some new machine that's going to process things faster to find a solution. God does not have to have antibodies to find the cure. Have you ever really stopped to consider that phrase, yours is the power? God does not face the limitations of this earth. And so that means that things don't have to stay the way they are. Marriages can come back to life. Health can be restored. Addictions can be broken. You remember Daniel? We often think of Daniel. We think of the lion's den. We think of him interpreting the king's dreams. But in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel is struggling in prayer for 21 days over a dream that he had. Imagine that, 21 days of prayer. We would struggle to give 21 days of prayer about anything. But he goes 21 days in prayer over this dream. And in verse 12, the Bible tells us this. And then he said to him, as an angel appeared to him, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. That is a powerful verse. The fact that from the very start, from day one, because he had set his heart to God, because he had humbled himself, that God was listening. He didn't have to wait for day five or day 10 or day 15 or even day 21. But what I want you to see is the latter part of that verse where it says, I have come because of your words. Because of your prayers, God has acted. Every single time you and I petition our Father, we are unleashing more and more power from the throne of God. Every time that we pray for that lost soul, we pour power into the conversion of that person. Every time that we pray for that friend who is struggling with something, we unleash power into their situation. 
And every single prayer that we pray for that person that maybe we're having a difficult time with, we inject power into that relationship. Beloved, there is nothing outside the reach of prayer except that which is outside of the will of God. And Paul would tell us in Ephesians chapter 3, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Isn't that an awesome verse? The idea that God chooses to display his power in us. The world that we live in is in turmoil. It is unstable, and heaven knows it's full of uncertainty. But there's an answer, and that answer is prayer. In fact, God is looking for people like you and me who are so connected to him in our prayers that he can release his power through us. It's a power that can overcome the trials, the challenges, the difficulties. It's a power that can change our world. When we learn to pray in the kingdom way, amazing results happen. When we connect with God in prayer, we are given his very presence and his power in our lives. In Jeremiah chapter 33, the prophet said, call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. We need to think of prayers as if we're rolling out the red carpet for God to come into the situation, to come into the circumstance in order that he might do his work. Prayer actually invites God to where he wants to be, to do what he wants to do. And finally, God-centered prayers pray for the unveiling of his glory. I think the acid test of when we are praying truly God-centered prayers is when we can say with all honesty, God, this is about your glory and not about what I want. I want this virus to go away. I want my life back. I want it to be normal again. But I want this to be for the glory of God. That's how Jesus prayed. He's about to face the cross in John chapter 12. And here's what he said. He said, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. There is nothing more challenging to our faith than what Jesus is teaching here. And you may be facing the greatest crisis of your life. You may be in a horrible situation in your job. You may be experiencing a burden that you never imagined. And what would it take this morning for us all to be convinced of what Jesus said? Father, bring glory to your name. God, bring glory to your name even if it hurts me. God, bring glory to your name even if it costs me. God, bring glory to your name even if it crucifies me. And the question of the morning is this. Am I ready to reflect the glory of God no matter what? Yours is the power and glory forever. I'm reminded of the cute story of the little girl who was riding home from church one day and she said to her mom, Mom, the, the preacher confused me today in his sermon. Now that might happen to y'all all the time. I hope not. But mom wanting to straighten it out said, Well, honey, what are you confused about? She said, Well, the preacher said that God is bigger than any of us and also that God is in us. Her mother confirmed those things, said, Yes, God is bigger than us and God is also in us. And the little girl responded saying, well, if that's the case, then shouldn't God show through us? And Paul would remind us, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So this morning, as we kind of wrap things up, God's agenda 
never changes. And what prayer does, prayer links us with this unwavering, eternal God that we have. From start to finish, God is God. And that's good news because every single day of our lives brings an all-new surprise. There was a neat story about a preacher that was on a cruise ship. He was going across the Atlantic. He was asked to speak to the first-class citizens uh, there that were on the boat, uh, that were passengers, rather, that were on the boat. And he decided that he would talk about answered prayer. As it turned out, there was an agnostic there in the audience. He didn't agree with what the preacher had to say. The next day, the preacher was asked to speak to those in coach. He decided, I'll preach the same sermon since they hadn't heard it. The Gnostic was going to go back to hearing. As it turned out, the Gnostic on his way back had a couple of oranges in his pocket. And he noticed a lady that was out on a cot out there on the deck of the ship asleep. So he thought kind of as a joke that he would take the two oranges and he placed both of the oranges in one in each hand as the lady lay there on the cot asleep. After the preacher had given his message, the man was making his way back and he noticed the lady was eating one of the oranges. Now, this was a rather elderly lady, so he walked up to her and he said, hey, where'd you get that orange? She said, my father gave it to me. And the man looked at her in surprise and said, your father's still alive? She says, no, my heavenly father. She said, I have been deathly seasick ever since I got on this ship. And I went to sleep praying that God would somehow give me an orange. And when I woke up, he had given me two. Jesus, in teaching his disciples, says that we conclude our prayers with an amen. And we do the same thing today. It's a word from the Hebrew that means sure and firm. And likewise, this is how we close our response to God in prayer. Amen to all that we know that's true about God. Amen to his eternal kingdom. Amen to his sovereign will. Amen to his pardoning grace. Amen to his delivering power. God-centered prayers build and rise upon this lofty summit that we pray to a God who is God forever. Amen. As we've stated before, we don't traditionally have the invitation anymore because we're not together. We don't stand and sing and give people an opportunity to respond to Christ That doesn't mean we can't respond. I hope that through all of this, through your personal Bible study, through the opportunities we have through online worship, that you've been able to give reflection to your life. And maybe if there's a need in your life, you can can pray and reflect upon that need and ask God to help you with all of that. We certainly hope that you'll stay safe. We hope that soon this will be over and we will be able to be back together. We hope that the messages that we have are encouraging and uplifting. Until we are able to meet again, either through online or together, be safe and God bless.